So I'm here to talk to you about innovation in Africa. And I was very lucky last year to be invited to speak at TED. And I talk about how innovation differs in Africa. And it, and it is innovation of the purest form. It's innovation out of necessity. And I define innovation as solving problems, solving real problems. The word innovation is overused in our society. If you're a bank and you rebrand your personal finance package, that is not innovation. <laughs> Upgrades are also not innovation. So why do we have so much innovation in Africa, or for that matter, in India? Because we have real problems, and I believe that innovation, the way I see it, is solving real problems in the world. In case you don't know, Africa is in the midst of this huge growth boom. The Economist wrote us off 12 years ago as the hopeless continent, and now everybody's calling us Africa rising. And in fact, it's a bit of a misnomer because most of that economic growth is resultant from mining and minerals and oils, and it's not broad-based, and it's not affecting everybody. As everywhere else in the world, especially here in India, I see some nodding, a lot of uh, the elite are, are, are generally benefiting and not everybody. It's de rigueur when you speak about Africa to put up this map of uh, the, the world from space. And what it shows is, uh, is not just how beautiful the world is or that you know, Africa has no electricity. It's actually a map of innovation. And it's a very easy to read map. Where everywhere there's electricity, there's no innovation. You know, because when you've got electricity, <laughs> when you've got electricity, what are you doing? Watching the cricket or trying to log on to this Wi-Fi. So, so even though India has a lot of electricity as its own challenges, you know that 650 million people in the world don't have access to electricity. There are more cell phones in Africa than people have access to electricity. And as Joe Madia said, um, there are more cell phones in India than there are toilets. So the, perhaps our most famous example of innovation you've all heard about is M-Pesa. It's a payment mechanism that uses incredibly basic cell phones, not the sophisticated uh, smartphones that you know, most of us probably have. Let's just double check by way of hand. Who has an iPhone? Who has a, an, a, an Android phone of some description? Yeah? Any push mucks still have a Blackberry? <laughs> OK. I just want to tell you it's okay to admit in public, you know. <laughs> it's okay. We all have our problems. <laughs> Actually, BlackBerry's operating system is wonderful. Their new devices are great. But we're talking about very basic phones like this, feature phones. And yet, despite the fact that the phone is dumb, the services around it are really smart and really clever. In PESA, you can pay anything anywhere. You know, I've watched this, this unfolding saga around Applegate and how people are, will Walmart use it, won't they use it, what's going on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Meantime, as we say in South Africa, we've been having it. You can pay just about anything. In fact, I heard a story the other day. A beggar knocked on someone's window near Nairobi airport, and he said, I don't have any money, and the guy said, in PESA. So it's these really basic phones, and mobile in many ways is the kind of gold of today because much of the services that you're going to see and hear about come from being able to use a mobile phone. In fact, I saw this yesterday. This is one of my favorite pieces of African technology, the dollars. It's been used uh, in every harbor around the world. The shipping industry would not be possible without this African technology. And just in case you didn't know, pay-as-you-go is an African technology pioneered by Vodacom in South Africa. This woman could be standing in a field, sending an SMS, or she could be using M-Pesa to pay for her kids to go to school, or she could be doing anything. That is the remarkable nature of these cell phones and what you can do with them. In fact, we've even found a better way to use Twitter. Everyone's still talking about what they're eating or what they're having for lunch. We found a way to use it to help us fight crime. Africa, as you know, is not a place for sissies, and some of the really powerful things that we've come up with are because we have a tough environment, and that much is true of India. So why is it that Africa churns out so many remarkable innovators? Because of the pain. And this is the first lesson for me. What Africa, and for that matter, India, can teach you about innovation that business school can't. It's the pain 
of the experience. And we've had some really wonderful speakers today talking about it. Joe Madriaf, I just love this guy and the way he talks about shit with, you know, absolute scant regard, head held high, M meter. These are really great examples of solving real problems. If you look at someone like Bunker Roy, he saw the pain of people living in villages without having any skills. The people who were trained, young men, he says were mobile and would leave, so he found somebody else to chain and uh, that was the grandmothers. I think that's a really remarkable way. And Barefoot College is a fantastic example of clear thinking, innovative thinking about how to solve real problems. In fact, he has what you guys call Jugad. Yes? Sorry, that's, we're in India, so it should actually be like this, right? <laughs> you know, I, I love Bollywood. I've always loved Bollywood. I mean, Bollywood's got a great formula for solving all problems, like, my, my girlfriend's just left me. Let's dance, you know. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting that Elon Musk never worked for NASA or Ford, and yet he is the protagonist of all of these powerful industries, space travel, the automobile industry. Why? Because it's something that the... the, the, the the uh, business school can't teach you. The business school teaches you expert thinking when actually what we need is outside thinking. You cannot read the label from inside the bottle. And uh, he's a South African, I don't know if you know. And uh, he, um, he's got this great line. He says, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. <laughs> and it's that perspective that he has because, you know, Expert thinking is all good and well, but really, what does business school teach us? Business school teaches people to go and hire an outside consultant to provide the outside thinking. <laughs> so what they really need to do is just hire an African or an Indian. You know, I, I've watched so many of my friends do MBAs. They're working 10-hour days. They come home, they study late at night, they work through the night, they do these assignments. That are, you know, they've managed to produce work whilst being sleep-deprived. I mean, that doesn't sound like higher education. That just sounds like parenting. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a great example. You know, uh, young Ursh, who actually did that Jugard animation for me, um, he saw the pain and suffering of a woman sitting in a, in a doctor's room who couldn't communicate. People who have, have locked-in syndrome or who are, who are paralyzed by stroke. It was him seeing the pain that gave him an outside perspective. His technology, you'll see, will revolutionize the world. I just love this guy as well, Arun Nachalam. Thank you for the difficult names, India. Thank you. And it was him watching his wife experiencing the five days of pain and, and suffering through her menstrual cycle that brought him not only to make a sanitary pad, but the machines to make them too. And not only did he give women relief from their menstrual cycles, but he also created an economic way for them to make money and to uplift people around. He is a really, truly remarkable guy. There's another fantastic Indian innovation I, I came across recently uh, that Intel has just funded called Delta ID. And the, you can see it, what it does is scan the iris, which is the colored part around uh, the CO, Salim Prakar, in there. And, uh, and it is a much more efficient way of using biometrics than your fingerprints. You know, your fingerprints wear out eventually, as my 86-year-old mother can tell you. If you work in the fields uh, and you use your hands all day, there's a chance that'll happen. Whereas biometrics around your eye are really great. So what's significant about that is it's been developed to work on the front-facing cameras of you know, really basic smartphones. But because of that, it will roll out into everything else. There will be a time where we will look into something and it will recognize us. Instead of our fingerprint reader, um, you know, we will get stuff through our eyes. The other thing all of these things in the emerging markets tell us is pragmatism. You've got to be highly pragmatic to know how to get things to work, because if they don't work, What's the point of doing something with them? As much as Nikola Tesla is, is, is the hero of the day and we venerate him and we love him, and I think he was an unspeakable genius. If you haven't read his life story, there's a book called The Man Who Invented the 20th Century. He was a genius. He discovered x-rays long before Madame Curie. He discovered uh, uh, long-range, short-wave radio communications that submarines still use long before Marconi. But it is not Tesla who made the lights go on in this building. 
it is Thomas Edison. And he's, his former boss and, and, and nemesis really you know, put him through the ringer, but it wasn't, it wasn't Tesla with all his genius who did it, it was Edison. And uh, people often accuse Microsoft of beta testing on the public. They put out a product that's ready, uh, that's been taken over by Google with Android. And uh, they iterate and iterate. That's what Edison did. He got a product out into the market. And as much as we deify Steve Jobs for his brilliance and excellence, actually, it was Bill Gates who got one and a half billion PCs on desks around the world. There's a really great African invention that you're going to hear a lot about. It's made by the guys who brought you Ushahidi, another very clever piece of African technology being reused around the world. This they call the backup generator for the internet. It is a really smart device that has a big battery. It'll last for, 20, uh, for eight hours. It'll connect up to 20 devices through anything, Ethernet, USSD, uh, even this Wi-Fi. And um, what's so remarkable about it is it is an African solution for an African problem that the whole world will find. Another great example of that is, is Frontline SMS, which was developed in South Africa uh, by a smart guy called Ken Banks to solve or help solve rhino poaching problems. And what it is is like a kind of WhatsApp for feature phones. So you can send one message to a whole group of people. It's really simple, really brilliant, really life-changing. This uh, is a picture of the mobile epicenter of the world, or as I like to call it, Lagos. And what's so remarkable is that because there's no other infrastructure in Africa, we have found ways to do things through our mobile devices that are just simply fantastic. Of course, the last lesson that business school doesn't teach you, apart from how to you know, file your last exam, is perseverance. And perseverance is personified by this remarkable young man called Siabonga Nguza. And uh, he's seen there with uh, Michelle Obama and, and Donald Gipps, the former ambassador to South Africa. I'm sure everybody leaves Donald out of the picture. Um, but what he's so renowned for is that he started, he wanted to invent his own rocket fuel, and he used to do it on his, the kitchen table of his mother's house in East, the Eastern Cape, which is where Nelson Mandela's from and where I went to school. He'd blow up the kitchen table, uh, and eventually he got a scholarship to go to Harvard, where, in fact, he invented this quite remarkable rocket fuel, and he's come up with a solution to the problems around fuel cells, uh, which you'll be seeing soon enough. So African technology is, is at the height of, of many things, and what Africa, and India for that matter, can teach you about innovation that business school can't is, firstly, you've got to feel the pain. You've got to see what it is that is the problem, and there's no better way to feel the pain than, you know, living where it is. If you're sitting in an ivory tower, uh, a business school environment with air conditioning and a laptop and Wi-Fi that works, you will, um, you will not kind of come up with the problems. You also need a sense of perspective. You need expert thinking, uh, sorry, you need outside thinking when the world is training everybody in expert thinking, and then of course you need the pragmatism and the perseverance to make it all happen. So, like I said last year, there's nothing left to say except <laughs>